Hi guys, I want you to close your eyes and tell me one city you would never want to live in. There's a 90% chance you said right here. Welcome to the south side of Chicago, also called Chirac. Known for gangs, murders, and taking its name from this place, Iraq, also called Iraq. Iraq is a unique land made up of fertile land between these two rivers where most people live and desert everywhere else where most people don't live. The modern day economy is made up of farming and bombing and exporting oil. It's a humble life. Over 80% of their exports are petro products while they import everything else. Okay, just sounds like a pretty typical Middle Eastern country, except for maybe that fertile part. They export oil through the Persian Gulf, and that's most of what they do. Big deal, right? The problem is, Iraq is a crude oil Arab nation, but has the economy of an olive oil Arab nation. That is to say, they've got some serious issues. Broken infrastructure, corruption, poverty, petrostate reliance, others don't believe in them and so they don't invest, and just plain instability. Instability in so many different areas, armed groups, oil shocks, actually just general shocks, sometimes having 30% growth, sometimes minus 11 or minus 60%. Food security is weak, their neighbors are not the most politically or mentally stable sometimes, the borders were just made up and often aren't respected when it comes to civil wars and explosions, and they have had an extremely fast growing population. Iraq is a young blood. They already have 45 million people and will double in about 40 years. They're way too populated to have a Gulf state style economy, who only have Arabs making up around a tenth of the nation, with slaves making up the rest. And of course, young men are the most prone to radicalization. Living in a country where over half the population lives in poverty and food supply is uncertain, seems like great conditions to get radicalized into me. This is even me after only 8 hours in Iraq. But the sad part is, Iraq used to be relatively rich, the second richest Arab nation in the 70s in fact. So why did it fail? By the way, this is also a two-part video with the other half about Afghanistan, so if you want to know how they broke too, watch that after this. Please? Let's go back. Way, way back. Back to when Iraq used to be Turkish. Okay, we can skip over World War I. They lost. Now Iraq is cut up by the British. Skip a little bit. They became a Hashemite kingdom in the 30s. Go forward. Economic ruin after World War II. But who didn't have economic ruin, right? Go forward and stop. Here is where we'll start our story. Welcome to Iraq in 1958, still a very young agricultural country, although with a heavy reliance on oil. Guess things never really change, huh? You could call Iraq here a British colony, you could call it a monarchy, and you could call it quasi-feudal. All are decently correct. But you could also call it the Middle East's next great experiment in state building, because that old monarchy, it just got overthrown in a coup by some republicans. Iraq was now a republic, free, and independent. So how would they make this new country considering Iraq had never really been a country before? I mean, besides some classical Mesopotamian states, Iraq had been ruled by some foreign power often. And especially not with these made up borders stuffing the Arabs in the south and the Kurds in the north into one country. I don't know, that was this guy's problem. His name? Abd al Karim Qasim. And arguably, his takeover and experimental state building of Iraq were the first steps to getting to the blown up country we know today. So what did Qasim do? Despite his questionable choice of mustache, he didn't actually hate Iraq's ethnic minorities. And he didn't hate the Soviets either, although he did have dreams about conquering his neighbors. He was a strong proponent of Iraqi nationalism, making a new nation from nothing. He loved economic planning, cutting ties with the West for the Soviet bloc, and prohibiting foreign companies from taking beloved Iraqi oil, seizing the British-owned Iraq Petroleum Company's land, and started the totally new, original Iraq National Oil Company. And he was a bit of a Kurdish simp. His dream was to build a united Arab Kurdish state across the Middle East, which of course strained relations with other countries around him who liked their independence. 
Kasim had isolated Iraq on the world stage, and he was also isolated inside of his own party, either from ideological difference or members of his government just not liking him that much. After all, these, we're gonna build a new society and take over the whole region type guys usually are not the most likable. So after some of his policies failed, such as attempting land reforms in this borderline fuel country and kicking out the main company you rely on, life got more expensive, especially in his darling Kurdistan, where they revolted. He was killed in a coup in 1963, later replaced by a general named Arif, who later died and was replaced by a general named Arif. They were brothers. And it wasn't long until he was killed and a new party took over Iraq. So if Kasim was only in power for 5 years, why did I spend such a long part of this video talking about him and not the Arifs? It's because it was Kasim's ideas that made the modern Iraq state, or at least the one that led to this type of failure. Iraqi nationalism, economic planning, and a strong irredentist party did not leave the nation when he was brutally killed and shown on national TV. A new coup against Arif the Older was brewing and done within hours. The new dogs in town, the Arab Socialist Ba'athist Party who took over in 1968. They upped the nationalism and for sure upped the socialism in Iraq. You know, continuing nationalization. They used central planning, strict bureaucracy, and heavy state control to throw Iraq into the modern industrialized world. This usually doesn't work, right? Usually something goes wrong, but high oil revenues and the swarms of young Iraqis being born into the world kept Iraq booming. Er, not this type of booming, the good type of booming. The Ba'aths were actually creating growth in Iraq. From the 60s to the 80s, it was around 8% per year, one of the highest rates on earth, turning Iraq from a poor country to the second richest Arab state behind Saudi Arabia. Not even strict planning and endless children can beat Saudi oil money. GDP grew well until the 80s, oil revenues quadrupled and mass infrastructure was made, linking the country together and giving its citizens access to the other type of liquid gold. It wasn't all sunshines and kebab though, dear viewer. Sure, profit sharing to workers and participation by workers and management in some of the more authoritarian and foreign firms sounds great, and it might be if done right, but it also made the rich, trained managers pretty pissed off who left Iraq taking their money and knowledge with them, leading to an industrial decline throughout the 60s. And the Arab Ba'at's policies towards Kurdish citizens were a little less lenient than the old republics were. Don't give them what they want, just slam them down. Yeah. It's better for national and party unity. Starting a conflict that is best described as a civil war between the Ba'athist Arab South and Kurdish North, sowing the seeds for the underdevelopment of the North, Kurdish resentment towards Iraq, and the creation of the radical Kurdish Democratic Party, who still do a little bit of bombing and shooting to this day. And possibly the biggest problem the Ba'aths created was their hierarchy system. What does that even mean? The Ba'athists attempted to create a society with no intermediate layers between the citizens and them. No other parties, no lord or duke or king or prince above you, no pesky corporations, no police acting on their own, no mas, eh, except religion. Islam was allowed to stay. Other than that, it was just party and you. And if you didn't agree with it, as many in Iraq didn't, you were faced with an iron fist to make sure you did. The theory has some weight. Syria also had their own Ba'athist movement and also ended up destroyed despite not having decades of war and invasions like Iraq did. But there's another huge problem. Despite clearly relying on authority to keep Iraq growing and together under this Ba'athist paradise, the party was clearly not consolidated enough. Internal debates about leadership and sometimes security units in the party acting rogue. One of these security units was a young man named Saddam Hussein who rose in power to eventually become the head of internal security. Internal security. Look at these two words, aka keeping those goddamn citizens in line. That was Saddam's job. Being essentially head security guard, he had his own clique of security agents in the party. Hey, you could call him a murderous tyrant or insane dictator, but he was pretty popular among his people. Ironically enough, he also thought the party didn't do nearly enough to stop dissent, despite being the dissent himself. 
He had risen to basically in charge, but we don't want that guy running the country status in the 70s. And when Iran had a revolution which threatened the Iraqi internal security, the man in charge, al bakr suspiciously resigned and Saddam, who was his vice president, was made head of the party in 1979. Countries are made up of often millions of people and are very dependent on the land and the situation they find themselves in geographically. It's pretty damn hard to ruin a country alone, and no one man ruined Iraq. But if there were a frontrunner, his name would be Saddam Hussein. Right as Saddam entered office, Iraq was likely at its peak, but his first act showed he didn't like the upwards trajectory the country was taking. He announced there was a plot to overthrow him, so he got everybody into one room and started listing off names. Whichever name he said would disappear to a lovely beachside vacation. In Jahannam, he used propaganda, mass killings, and brutal policing to keep his people in line. Guess he learned that at the internal security department. And he cut ties with almost all countries, especially this one to the east of Iraq. I ran. You ran where? Over the border? <laughs> Oh wait, you really did. For many reasons, Saddam declared war on Iran. From its new revolutionary ideas he was scared of spreading, from growing religious tension between Sunni and Shia Muslims, from border disputes mainly over the oil producing region of Khuzestan, from plain old nationalism and driving up popularity, but mostly from fear that Iran would invade Iraq first. Gotta focus on internal security, right? After all, if Iran were to invade in a couple of years, they would easily have had the geographical, population, and military advantages. Iraq was punching above its weight militarily at this time, and Iran wasn't the most organized after the revolution, whereas Saddam spent his entire career organizing people. So the Iraqis invaded for two months straight, then got into a stalemate for six years. I'm not going to go into the details since military history bores me to death, but by 1987, Iraq finally got the advantage in terms of troops and attempted to build some weapons of mass destruction. Mass destruction. Mass destruction. Mainly chemicals, but still didn't make too big of a dent in Iran's defense. What a terrible idea this whole thing was. Did Saddam ever leave the lowlands of Iraq in his life? Has he seen a mountain range? They're huge! And Iran is one of the best naturally defended countries on Earth. I said the mountain thing as a joke, but after reading a quick biography of Saddam Hussein, he spent the first few decades of his life in the lowlands for real. The war ended in a draw in 1988. What wasn't a draw was the destruction. Over one million Iraqi soldiers and citizens were killed, whole towns and cities were destroyed, the petrostate's somewhat viable economy was destroyed with oil infrastructure blown up and the country in about 60 billion dollars of debt from the war. If the war didn't affect you physically, then rising food prices, unemployment, and their newly collapsed currency put you and millions others into poverty. So how does Saddam, the great central planner of Iraq, plan to fix this? Iraq only had a three year recovery period and it needed some quick cash badly. Iraq had tried to privatize, but many investors feared the regime would switch up on them and take their buildings. There was also too much corruption and bureaucracy and most government assets were straight up unprofitable from the whole war it caused. The free market was basically scrapped in 1990. Okay, so if you can't make money by yourself, the next best thing is to ask others for money. Particularly, the crazy rich, rich ass Gulf states who they're indebted to for the war. And Iraq said, pretty please, can you forgive our debt to you? No. no. Well, at least I didn't exceed our oil quota. Huh? huh? That's right, Iraq accused the Gulf states of exceeding the oil production quota for their cartel, OPEC, which lowered its price and lost Iraq billions, at least from their eyes. They also accused Kuwait of drilling horizontally under the sand border and stealing their Iraqi oil, $2.4 billion of it. Iraq wasn't having any of it and Kuwait is extremely small. In fact, most of its residents weren't even Kuwaiti citizens. Just think of how ripe they were for some liberation. So that, along with some classic nationalism, drove the two countries to war in 1990. It was a quick war. Iraq conquered the South in six days, but the UN, aka the US, 
didn't like it, saying if you don't free Kuwait by 1991, we're gonna come in and you in. Iraq thought that was just a load of so they were prepared to face the whole coalition. And just look at the size of this war. It was Iraq versus the whole world. It took about a hundred hours for Operation Desert Storm to take over the country after some bombing for weeks before. Kuwait was now free. Iraq was blown up again. It's weapons of mass destruction. Mass destruction. Mass destruction. Were taken away and this time an embargo was placed on it. That did the most damage, not being able to sell oil, not the bombs, not millions in poverty, rich Iraqis not selling their oil. Look at their GDP in 1989, 65 billion in 1990 tripling to 180 billion and in 1991 doubling to 400, wait no, that's actually 400 million. 400 million? Mr. Beast is even worth more than that. So Iraq was broken again, and at least the UN let them sell oil for food in the creatively named Oil for Food program. It was just a slump. It's estimated that about $230 billion in infrastructure was blown up in the Gulf War, and another $170 billion lost in oil revenue came from the trade embargo. And along with more bombings in 1998 for fears of weapons of mass destruction. Destruction. Destruction being made, Iraq was shattered. Let me sit here and ponder by the ocean and watch some airplanes and shooting stars in the night sky to clear my mind. Everybody says, who does he think he is? I just told you who I thought I was. A god! Who's really something, mother? Meet. You got a problem with that, huh? Step up if you got a problem with that. Come on, let's go. What the hell? Who did this? Who did this? Who did this? On September 11th, 2001, the U.S. Ooh. suffered its biggest attack since Pearl Harbor. It united the nation for one thing, revenge. Their main suspect, one named Osama bin Laden. He looks like this. Not the most European looking fellow one might say. He looks more Eastern, Middle Eastern. And it didn't matter how many attempts it took. It didn't matter if they hit the wrong target one too many times. It didn't matter if they got the wrong country. Bruh. They were going into the Middle East again to kill this bastard. That wasn't even me. That was him. Oh, so the US started its war on terror. Which terror? Obviously Middle Eastern terror. Starting with Afghanistan breaking their organized terror ring and maybe making them spread across the globe for refuge. Some of them going to Arabia. And the US, very paranoid of the Middle East at this time and scared that Iraq could become the next hot vacation spot for terrorists invaded in 2003. They also had had enough of Saddam's shenanigans and wanted him out of Iraqi power. The US claimed Iraq broke their UN treaty and started to host some weapons of mass destruction. Mass destruction. Mass destruction. Turns out that was a complete lie. Oopsies. Honest mistake. Happened to me last week, but for the Iraqi population, it didn't matter. Bombs were still coming. The US took over in about half a month and this time they wouldn't let Saddam go, capturing him and setting up their own government called the Coalition Provisional Authority, which is the most boring name for a government in history. Oil for food was ended and sanctions were gone because it was practically a US territory for a year under the CPA. But their new economy, one with an inexperienced financial sector, blown up infrastructure and just generally mismanaged and corrupt surprisingly failed to make Iraq grow. In fact, food prices soared, millions became unemployed, energy systems and roads were shut down, and the government stopped providing services. Although that wasn't probably because of management issues, it was more likely because of this. Bombing a poor young country isn't actually that great at making it more stable. And every time they tried to kill a terrorist group, I swear two more popped up. 
like an Iraqi Hydra. Kill the Ba'athist and suddenly Ba'ath militias, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State pops up, execute Saddam Hussein and suddenly you got Sunnis, Shias and Kurds revolting. It was these new groups and US obsession for a 100% terrorist free zone that made the disaster of an invasion last until 2011. 100,000 Iraqis died, the country was impoverished, the government was dissolved, and the military was disbanded. Seems like the perfect addition for something radical to me. Hundreds of thousands of young, angry, poor, and trained soldiers living in poverty with no army or government to listen to? First the Arab Spring in 2011, tons of revolts and tons of protests. And then biggest of all, these guys in 2014. They call themselves the ISI, the Islamic State of Iraq. Wait, they're called ISIS now that they spread into Syria. Damn these guys move quick. ISIS was slash is a radical sunny group who promised to take down the weak democratic Shi government of Iraq and build a brand new caliphate. They were also the first jihad group to go social media famous. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, these guys were getting likes and comments and subscriptions all over. Oh yeah, they are also terrible humans. They killed, kidnapped, burnt down cities and seized non-Muslims land, and they took over one third of Iraq in 2014 including the second largest city, Mosul. We gotta go back in, said the US rounding the gang up for more bombing and more whack-a-mole with Islamic terrorists, until 2017 when they were more or less gone from Iraq. And ever since then, yeah, it's been modern day Iraq. Instability, destruction, protests, militant groups, but to be fair, they are trying to stamp out corruption with new political reforms, producing oil at record high levels, and overall are growing. So Iraq failed long before the US invaded. Why? Because Iraq was built on a system which rewarded more and more and more authority, aka the Ba'athist rule paved by Qasim's ideas. This slowly turned into a one-man party and one pretty brutal crazy man at that under Saddam Hussein's leadership. He got Iraq into a bunch of wars, blah blah blah, ending with the US invading and dismantling any old authority structure there still was which caused the Iraqi power struggle we've seen for the past decade. Basically making Iraq based on strict authority and removing the authority destroyed the country. Iraq is slightly improving though, you know where it's not? Afghanistan. They're getting a whole lot worse and spoiler alert, it's because of the exact opposite reasons as Iraq. So, go watch this video. Go!